Hey everybody, it's Wade here, and yep, you got it. You are listening to the Rules of Acquisition remix. Danger, danger, we're getting into a Lawaxana Troy episode, you know it. But hey, wait a minute. This one just might, we just might come out of it being okay. Uh, I haven't done one of these in a while. I feel like I relate to Lawaxana more as a parent now. No, I don't. That's not true. I'm, I'm not that old, but... Um, Anyways, it's a it, hey, it's it's a Troy episode. It's uh, you know, like we said, this DS9 is a show with commitments, and one of those is to romance. <laughs> uh, but we'll talk more about that later. Anyways, uh, listen to this pod. I think it's it was it was it's a fun episode, and I will talk to you more on the back end. Odo first says he and Nurse Chapel are in Turbo Lift 7. Oh yeah. But later Cisco says they are in Turbo Lift 4. Oh yeah. What the hell writers? This sucks. Oh yeah. It's time for the Nobody Follows Any Continuity Show. Hello and welcome to the Rules of Acquisition podcast where we're going through... Every single episode of Star Trek Deep Space Nine, the greatest TV show. Uh, <laughs> it will be. It will work its way to being the greatest TV show. It gets better. <laughs> it's a great show. Yeah, it gets so much better. But I mean, I say like this is move along home. It's already gotten a lot better from that standpoint. Mm-hmm. But whatever. Okay, I'll shut up. Now. With me, as always, is James Nolan. Hello. And Hugh Crawford. Hello, gentlemen. And I'm Wade Bowen, and tonight we are talking about the 16th episode of the first season. We're nearing the end of the first season. Ever so slightly inching forward. We've got six more after that. Yes. But we're looking forward to it. We have an episode called The Forsaken, which is the 16th episode, right? Yep, that's right. This originally aired on May 23rd, 1993. The IMD description is as follows. Lexwana Troy comes for a political visit and instead hounds Odo for romantic attention. Meanwhile, an alien probe wreaks havoc with the station's computer, leaving Odo and Lexwana trapped together. This is actually a lot better episode than that description. (laughs) Yeah, the Forsaken or O'Brien gets a puppy. (laughs) <laughs> okay, so the O'Brien episode is oh, I, the Laxana stuff is surprisingly good, right? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Okay. Yeah, like we had a Q episode before. Again, huge whole thing. This is a show with obligations. Yes. They had to get a Laxana Troy. Uh huh. She's a major obligation. Personally, I liked that Q episode more than I liked the other one. A lot of other ones, y'all did not, but I did. Uh, and I actually like this Laxana episode. I like this. I like this one a lot. I like it more than anyone. Well, no, but like, like it's got three plots. Yeah. The Loxana plot's fine. The other two are kind of awful. O'Brien's puppy. And what's the other one? Uh, the O'Brien's puppy in the Bashir has to kiss everybody. These ambassadors oh. ass. See, I actually liked it's like, oh, Bashir, something other than just like a swing of dick in this one, at least. Yeah. Yeah, that didn't bother me either. I liked that storyline. But the computer takeover Technobabble plot. Yeah. That was so convoluted and so poorly done. Yes. <laughs> yes. I didn't quite understand. I didn't even understand that it was an alien probe until I read it in the damn IMDB description. <laughs> yeah, it is a little ham-fisted. They do it and then they come back from like a commercial break and then they're like oh it's it's like a life form they just they don't really yeah they didn't discover anything they just all talk about it they come back from a break and they say it's a life form and then all right everybody understands that let's go forward it's like a puppy but even before that i actually wrote down that i liked the techno babble oh really (laughs) yeah because it it just confounded me like i don't like i don't understand what they're trying techno babble in the show is a tool and I feel like they're they don't know how to use their tools all the time. Well, I think they tried to ameliorate it by having Avery Brooks rock around and like not understand it either. Yeah, like he's like, "What does that mean?" Okay, you know, like, do you hear the compu- differences between the computers? And he's just kind of like, "I don't give a shit." Like, yeah, what? it's techno babble. O'Brien understands techno babble. This episode, the O'Brien plot is about two characters: O'Brien and the computer, and then later the puppy. But uh, I kept getting distracted by his Bajoran 
chesty friend. Not distracted in that way, but it seems like they kept trying to make her a character. And so at some point I thought, oh, they kind of threw her in. Yeah, yeah. And then I was like, is she just a background player that they're giving like more lives than Dax got in this episode? <laughs> yeah, that's exactly right. No, but I liked it because they set up that the techno babble. I mean, it was all very technical, but it set up what the difference between what a Cardassian computer, Cardassian computers suck. Mm -hmm. It was very technical. I'll give it that. But it's logical. It fits in with itself. And it's why he can't get it to talk to it, because Cardassians expect different things from their computers. And he's trying to make it be like a Federation computer that stays with it, that is a lot more um, efficient. And the Cardassians are willing to let things slide with efficiency as long as they can get more power or if it can, I don't know, lock down things better. But the efficiency is not their concern. And there's probably a way to tell that story. But I don't know if this was the way to do that. Yeah. Yeah. Maybe this was just for uh, people that really get off on nerdy things because it's not. It's yeah. But maybe it was also I think it was was it because they couldn't use if I'm right at some point the computer changes voice. Is that right? I don't remember. It doesn't technically change. The person doing the voiceover for the computer doesn't change. It's Loxana Troy. <laughs> Is it really? Yeah. That's she's the ship's computer. Yeah. It's Majel Barrett. It's always been Majel Barrett. Yeah. Ever since, like, the original series, right, guys? Didn't she do it in the original series, too? Wasn't she the ship's computer in the original series? Oh, she may have been. In the next generation, she was. Next generation, she definitely was. She wasn't for... Because she was Nurse Chapel in the... Well, I know she could be both. I don't know. <laughs> she was, yeah, she was true. both here. In fact, I thought that's why they had the storyline for when they had her for some reason. I don't know. Yeah, that's what I was thinking, is that they were doing it because at some point she talks to the computer, and the computer doesn't answer. Because that'd be weird. <laughs> and I think that was, I think they were having fun with that or trying to. Yeah. It was some sort of like knowing wink. I forgot she was the voice entirely, yeah. but I did. So I didn't pick up on that. But that's definitely probably a meta thing that they threw. Yeah, with. that's what I was thinking. So. But O'Brien says it sounds different. You can hear it, but he's the only one that can hear it because he's the one that's so intimately involved with it. Yeah. If I believe on the, on the original series, the computer didn't talk. It just made that whistle. Yeah. And that's right. yeah. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's nice to see that Miles has a work buddy he trusts. Yeah, yeah. I guess. <laughs> so yeah, we open the first scene is Bashir and all the diplomats. Uh -huh. Okay, can we talk about that scene a little bit? We have the pale Klingon with the Botox injections. I don't know what kind of alien she's going to be. Oh, an Abuzan, which are a very repressed people, but they just looks like a weaker an Abuzan. They, yeah, apparently she needs a dildo like that's what someone <laughs> yeah right mott the barber told her so the alien design on that was just like oh let's give him a forehead thing like a klingon but just not as much they gave the klingon gave it botox that's what they do man lessen some of them wrinkles and then just send her on her way <laughs> it made her repressed instead of angry she sort of looks like a denobulan from enterprise but not really i think it was just really yeah just we're gonna give you random right. ridges yeah Okay, but uh, makeup aside, we've got three difficult Starfleet ambassadors. Now, uh -huh. there's no other reason for them to be difficult other than to give Bashir something to do with the narrative. Mm -hmm. right? Right. Yeah. Yeah. Like nobody ever unpacks why they're such assholes. And I don't even quite understand why they're there in the first place. Well, because that's how you get the looks one on Troy, because she's an ambassador. No, I understand that they're like a narrative device to get looks one on Troy there. But and that, whoa, whoa, whoa. I, this I know. They said in the beginning of the line, at the beginning of the show, that they were they were going to go on like a sightseeing exploratory committee thing into the Gamma Quadrant. So it's like any ambassadors, they're pampered dilettantes that are given this position and they expect to be wined and dined all the time. That's what ambassadors do if they're not spies. <laughs> <laughs> mm -hmm. And it seems like I'm not familiar with just tons of old naval stories, but that seems like that's probably like an old common yarn of, you know, some guy having to go and like suck up to these people. Right. right. Uh, I was thinking like Pete Campbell. Oh, yeah, yeah. Like his job, <laughs> like in Mad Men was to kind of do that. Right, like, right. He's an accounts guy. Yeah. Show the people from four to good a time. Yeah. yeah. All right. You're on accounts. Go <laughs> yes. get these people drunk and show them a good time. <laughs> yeah. Bashir was on accounts. Yeah. And he says at the beginning, like Pete Campbell would be like, hey, you want to go get some whores? <laughs> and they're like, no, how dare you? <laughs> they immediately, they only recognize the holodeck as whorehouses. Yeah, sex. We've had Next Generation where they've been everything but, mm -hmm. and then we get here and they're just whorehouses to everybody. Yeah, I guess that that's a thing where just Deep Space Nine is going full into like the things that they came up with, right. which is the whorehouse hollow suites. And I dig it. Yeah. Two Ferengis, that's probably all they're good for. No, I, yeah. It's novel to a Ferengi that you'd use it for anything other than 
fucking. Mm-hmm. You could also use them for gambling that could be heavily rigged towards the house. That's something they could have do it too. Yeah, that's a little too obvious though, right? Yeah. Nobody would trust a Ferengi. That's true. Okay, guys, I have a quick question about what Cisco said when he was explaining to Bashir about why he's getting that shit job. He said that Curzon used to make him do the same thing. He sure did say that. <laughs> now, I don't know. Was Curzon, was he a captain in Starfleet or what what, what was he? I had that same question. Yeah, like, wait a minute. What is Curzon's rank? And did he get demoted when he moved to Jadzia? Because cause he used to be his superior. Now he's, like, not. Okay, so let's, yeah, let's talk about... Sh- the first trail we ever meet is, ironically, an ambassador in the next generation. And he's on a sensitive mission. The man, the trill dies, but the symbiote lives on in Will Riker's stomach for a while. And then at the end, in like a, a lady. But at the end, she's still an ambassador. The young girl that takes the new trill at the end of that episode. She's still an ambassador, which is a position of rank and merit you would attain through meritocracy. So why... Why doesn't Dax just have Curzon's rank? Yeah, that's what I don't... It seems like they're setting that up, but then, like, she doesn't, well, right? maybe she does. I mean, she's still high rank now, right? She's a science officer, but she's... Is she Lieutenant Dax against her? Is that what she is? What is her What is her rank? Yeah, let me see. What is it Lieutenant again? Because then maybe, you know, if Curzon was bossing Cisco around when he was just a private, maybe. But the implication is that Curzon had this full life of prestigious jobs yeah and was a high-ranking and well-respected individual Mm -hmm. 300 years of experience according to bashir he had to throw that up in the ambassador's face that's like the one moment jadzia had in the whole episode is whenever (laughs) she gets insulted and bashir actually sticks up for her yes uh she started off uh as apparently she started off as an ensign and moved up to a lieutenant so she's ensign when Deep Space Nine starts? Uh, no, I think before. Oh, uh, when she... Okay, well, that's still weird. So do they demote... What do Trills... Aside from that next generation, do they demote most of them? Or maybe Curzon... We don't know. Curzon Dax got into a lot of shit. Maybe he got demoted at some point. I don't maybe. Know. I have no, Yeah, I don't know. Or maybe left Starfleet. I don't think they thought it out, you know? <laughs> it's, it's like they just made it up as they went along. They did not think it out well enough. That's for sure. Maybe she changed focus? Right, yeah. Yeah, 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 maybe. Maybe Curzon was an operations or an engineer. and Right, we have no inkling that he was in a science officer, maybe, to go back to that. You have to start over. Yeah, we'll say that. Yeah, and I doubt that Cisco would have hung around with a science officer or had occasion to right. in Starfleet. He would have probably been someone who was also in command level structure. Right. You know? And Curzon sounded like he was in an ambassador type position when he was having sex with that woman. And yeah, oh, that's right. <laughs> uh, the long black veil episode. Yeah, yeah. The- so my favorite thing is that Avery Brooks just slipped in that he was fired from that job for punching a rapist. <laughs> right. Oh, right. Yeah. Oh, and the way he delivers that, he he's so sly about that. And he's like, it was just a little misunderstanding. Yeah. You know, he's just. He's so fucking cool. Yeah, he's cool. Yeah. Yet again, they're just like, he just punched a rapist and lost his job. And I don't know. I like to think that the Federation ambassador, which is what we were talking about in that story, are still, there's still rape in the Federation. He must have been an admiral or something. You know, he, he progressed into being a bad guy by getting too many ranks. Or or like, I guess those Andorians could be, be handsy. I don't know. I don't know. You're, you're don't talking know. about uh, Enterprise, which I haven't watched. Yeah, but there's Andor. I forget what's Andor. That's my favorite. You sure. You're right. They're, they're the blue ones with the blue ones with the antenna and the white hair. Only blue ones I care for are Mont the Barbers people. And Mont right. the Barber, which we need to find their name out at, yeah, at some point. So it, isn't it a little weird that the Ferengi have a cousin? Yeah, the alien Newman cousins or whatever. Yeah, that it looked like Albert E. Newman to me. <laughs> it did, yeah. I wrote down alien E. Newman because he was ridiculous looking. Yeah, that was, was kind of weird. It stole her latinum hairbrush band. Yeah, that she said for 36 generations, which is a fucking long time. Right, and I thought latinum was liquid. No, it's this bar. I thought the bars were gold. The gold press latinum is you have the gold and the liquid latinum with in the gold. I don't know. Oh, shit. I think you're right. I think that's just sloppy. I don't know. Well, you could have, a, if you had a gold thing with liquid latinum in the middle of it, you'd probably just call it a latinum hairbrush. <laughs> I knew we should have booked that metallurgist as our guest. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I knew it. Damn it. Yes. 
a xenometallurgist. Is latinum on the periodic chart? I don't even know. So we spent a lot of time with this shitty Julian storyline. That's the one we hated the most. Yeah. We kind of like the Bashir one, but the Lexwana and Odo, we really have some actual good acting with a lot of choices. We do. Right. Uh, before we get to that, another thing I noticed from the dumb ambassador storyline, the Botox Klingon complains about the Cardassian bedding and stuff. And she talks about the Cardassian gargoyles in her room, mm-hmm. which we've never seen. Wood poles in her room. Mm-hmm. There's Cardassian wood everywhere. Where the fuck is this wood that she's talking about? That's crazy. Yeah. But whatever. If you're going to have Cardassian woodwork, show some Cardassian woodwork. All right. That's all I had. I agree. Someone in the writer's room should have caught that. I was also going to just say because i've been really down on the acting that i think that across the board the acting on this episode was all pretty good yeah yeah like the usual suspects julian i think kira maybe had a line or two i thought it was well delivered and modulated more towards the way she gets i think jedzia was fine i think the, the car was ready for the trip yeah for all of the main characters and only odo got a good car to drive yeah yeah everybody else just had that weird puppy storyline and just a lot of techno babble not a lot to do but they were doing that fine so across the board i think that the acting may have gotten to a base level good or where everybody's comfortable with each other yeah yeah and with being this crew on the show they're starting to figure it out yeah yeah like last week james talked about the thing that he hated in tv shows where everybody's just like leaning around and it's just another sleepy day and some chaos happens and then at the end of it it's like well we're all back to normal yeah (laughs) this episode actually had one of my least favorite tv tropes and actually spun it into gold which is stuck in the elevator stuck in the elevator (laughs) i was like we've had two full star trek series and they've yet to do a stuck in the elevator and here they do and you think at first oh shit a stuck in the elevator how do you get stuck in the elevator in the 24th century when you can beam shit off well they figured out a way to around that yeah Mm -hmm. well i appreciated that after that episode way back when they're stuck in a a shuttle bay or whatever and they they can't get them out of the ship and they don't even try teleporting them like come on oh yeah i think i said that's fucking stupid Stupid. And here they throw away a line about how Cardassians have some reason that you can't do that. Like, okay, fine. At least you addressed it. Oh, no. When they tried to beam them out, the puppy dog computer wouldn't allow it. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. And it, yeah, you're right. It wouldn't allow it. And then, yeah, they have a thing where there's some phase technology that won't let the energy because it'll zap him if he tries to get through or whatever. And then later on, he's wondering, like, what are the odds of him actually getting zapped? Yeah, he's like, get me out of here. <laughs> really wanting to get out of there. But what we have, we have some Odo actually being vulnerable for once to somebody. He's never been in a liquid state in front of somebody that wasn't examining him for scientific purposes. And let's want to Troy's strangely touching about it oh yeah yeah and we actually get to see some depth from her that we never got to see from star trek the next generation she's very cartoony in the next generation and i was really surprised to see yeah yeah like i liked her so much more in this yeah. yeah yeah that was just my point is that we got to actually see some depth from her that we hadn't seen before right because in next generation all she is is a foil for her daughter Who's more repressed and she's like, oh, come on, you can be a little bit more loose and not as formal. Yeah, it's a long tradition of having like a tough guy that you give him an episode where he's got to be like vulnerable Mm -hmm. or soft, you know, like that kind of storyline. And they're usually I like those stories. Well, I mean, they're done a lot in like in Westerns and stuff like that, where you have, you know, someone who's like a knight Mm -hmm. in middle age, you know, and so I think it's that kind of story. And he's got to show his soft side and literally in this, you know, (laughs) (laughs) right. Soft, melty side. So one of the things I was going to talk, like, because we, I like the storyline a lot. I like it, too. But one of the things that I was thinking of when I was watching it is how, like, I know, like, how old he is. But, like, how old is Odo? Because he has this romance or, or sort of romance here in this episode. It's not consummated or anything, but it's a, it's a romantic moment. Oh, totally. With a fairly elderly woman. Right. I mean, she looks pretty great for her age. Right. It was actually, I felt age appropriate, yeah. like an age appropriate match. Yeah. But, okay. So but not to get into spoilers, but later on in the season it shows... He has a relationship someone with else. someone I'm going to say is in her mid-20s or late 20s. Right. And that always feels a little bit weird, too. Yeah. I was going to say, I like this romance. If they followed through with him and Alexana romance and not the stuff that they get to later, mm-hmm. I would have preferred that yeah. so much more because... That's what I was... Okay, because I was... Me, too. I view it that same way, too. I haven't watched those other ones in a while, 
But this felt felt so much more sincere and genuine a romance than that other one did. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. So you have to go like, do you feel like that maybe you're setting your age at, let's say, Rene Abergenois' true age, which is probably a little bit under Majel Barrett's age, but it's comparable, though. Well, I can feels... look it up real quick. I'm on that episode on IMDb. Yeah, it, he was the candelabra and like Beauty and the Beast. You think of him as b pretty old. Yeah. You know, like he's he's a middle aged. He's a, a aging actor while filming this. He's eight years younger than she was born in 1932 and he was born in yeah. 1940. So, yeah, that's pretty good yeah yeah i mean he's got a son that's an actor who's in a lot of stuff you know who's not like a young kid who's like an older you know he plays guys older than us mm -hmm. his son does in shows so okay so that's what i was thinking so this felt more right than where it goes i'm just not sure and i don't mean like how old he is but like what's his age on the show like what are they trying to tell us is i think mentally he's a he's a middle-aged man that's what i think okay right well the kardashians were ruled Bajor for 60 years. Mm -hmm. They found him while the Kardashian occupation was going on, right? Yeah. So he's, and Luxana is probably, I don't know how Betazoid's age, but she's probably, she's probably the same age. Yeah. Or as, more him, you know, it's. Yeah. She's, let's say that she's Majel Barrett's age. Yeah. Which is sure. 1932, whatever, like the math on that is. She was old enough to be married to Gene Roddenberry for like 40 years. Right. Uh, like before this show aired. So I don't know like how. Yeah. So it, that feels right to me. So it just but watching it made me feel that the other stuff that we have to go is a little grosser. Yeah, I definitely couldn't. Yes. You know, knowing what I know happens yeah. later, I couldn't view it without thinking of that. And I was like, this is so much better. A romance. Yeah. It feels right, and it feels righter. Yeah. Uh, because you automatically think of Odo as older. Right. Okay, just so like, that's what I was thinking. Okay. And it's just so well done. Yeah. Like, mm -hmm. the intimacy and the actors are all doing a great job. She's doing a great job when she's, yeah. like, when she takes her wig off, and she's like, hey. That's a and, great scene. Oh, that's a really, a really good scene. scene. Yeah, yeah. They have chemistry. It's almost a great scene that, like, Majel Barrett herself is. It's a scene where, like, the idea of actresses and, like, not wanting to seem unpretty mm -hmm. in things, unless you're going for, like, an act, uh, like, Charlize Theron and Monster or something like that. Right, right. But even then, you're still, you're not vulnerable. It's still, they're putting prosthetics on her to make her look ugly. But the idea of some <laughs> a, a woman taking one of these, like, a woman, the Majel Barrett, not Loxana Troy, right. taking off this wig and showing this sort of, you know, like, an, like, you know, like, not the pretty display that she was at the beginning of the episode. That's a nice moment. Like, yeah. she said, like, both were sacrificing stuff in the scene. And I think both actors were sacrificing. It's, it's a really good scene. It's a scene that, that was so good, it took me by surprise that I liked it as much as I did. Yeah, because you think, oh my God, it's Alexana Troy. Right. And I guess that's my point with the elevator cliche is that we've seen that in sitcoms and stuff all our lives, but that was the first time it was actually done well. Yeah. Right. It's like the bottle episode trope, but this one, they're not in the bottle the whole time. It's more of a bucket episode. <laughs> a bucket episode. <Yeah. laughs> also, they did subtle things with blocking and shoot and like where the camera was. Yeah. With him I, crouching down and whatnot. Yes. yes. And her going down. Mm -hmm. Two and there was a while that there was a two shot. I mean, so there was a sexual. I'm going to say it was a sexual context and a vulnerable sort of intimate. Let's say intimate. Yeah, yeah. And that and like that, that that it was shot in the way that like sexual scenes are shot. Right. Well, that's interesting because like not sexy, not porny, but no, like, no. But Luxana's whole thing is sex. She's talking about yeah, all these fucking Ferengis. Yeah, and, yeah, yeah. There's the all these other things. Yeah, which. It's intimate, but then it gets really intimate when it gets past the sex. Yeah. When she's mm -hmm. when they open up to each other. That's part of what made it such a great episode, I thought, you know? Yeah, no, 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 I agree. Yeah, it, it was like the director's realized that they were working in a visual medium again <laughs> yes finally <laughs> finally because, yeah yeah because there's two shots that stick in mind one of which is when they're both standing and she's older and so she's like i'm tired and so she like she like immediately goes down and it visually looks weird because mm -hmm. he's still standing and then they go to them in a two shot which it's her face and like his crotch yeah. in a two shot for like a while where they're talking all of that is weird but i also it's disorienting and it's also like it's weird to me. It's weird to Odo. So, like, I feel like, and I'm sure that that makes, it made me feel uncomfortable, much like it was making Odo feel uncomfortable. Also, when he's actually starting to melt a little, and he's mm -hmm. off in the corner, and he looks like a kid in the shower, uh, you know, like in a, like a, like in a shower, like, like a public shower. Yeah. Like, he, he has that sort of, sort of posture to him. 
all of that's really good choices, you know, because that is sort of the that's the same emotional state, you know, like mm-hmm. this is an intimate thing. He's kind of naked or he will be. He doesn't want to necessarily share that with her. So that it's all good. Yeah. Stuff. I turn into a liquid mm-hmm. every inch, like, but I can swim. And, you know, there's some good lines. Yeah, that's. Oh, weird. yeah. She's going to get she's she's going to oh, get God. wet one way or the other. She just so. That was a weird. That's OK. But yeah, the swim line was weird in a way that like that's a weird line to me. But yeah, you're right. Uh, um, one of my favorite parts of this episode <laughs> is uh, whenever Odo actually brings and he rarely goes. Have you noticed that? Odo rarely asks for help from anybody mm-hmm. ever, mm-hmm. but one of the few times he does, he goes to Cisco <laughs> oh, right. with his left swan, a Troy problem. And, yeah. and Cisco says, I can't help you. Like just get laid or, you know, <laughs> or just tell her you're not interested. Just, yeah. Or you know, tell her to go away. Yeah. Just mm-hmm. do one or the other. Yeah. Um, yeah. No. That was a good scene. That was one of my favorite it was a very playful Cisco scene where he's like, what do you want me to do, man? Come on. Does the, have they made it clear that Odo doesn't, and th- this is weird, to, I don't know how you would make this clear, but have they made it clear that Odo doesn't have physical pleasure? Yes, they did. He actually was telegraphing that to her when he was talking about food. Yeah. He says, I don't eat. Because this is not a mouth. Yeah. I don't eat. I think that was his way of saying I don't have a dick. I can make a dick, but it's not a dick. Yeah. I can make one, but it, it's an approximation. Right. Well, and she says something pretty like. I, I haven't been with a shapeshifter. Yeah. They can be whatever shape I want, basically. You can have a big dick. You can have a big dick, and that's what I need. It, it, that's what she's. That's the subtext. Right. Of yeah. She's like, I've always had the shape men to me, and now you can do the shaping yourself. They tried to make it better, but like, yeah. Right. So they haven't made it clear that, like, he doesn't have orgasms i mean i know not in a traditional way well, but they don't. the guy can't eat and taste stuff we know he's not having orgasms i think that's what they're trying to tell i know to us. but but he does have a later on they, they've already set up that he can have relationships which is an implied just through star trek relationship that there's intimacy involved mm-hmm. and he's like talking about klingon opera and, and how much he hates women for some reason <laughs> about relationships yeah. yeah so he can have romantic relationships save kind of established except you're still left wondering why he would at all yeah and i get that he's lonely i mean the whole thing is that he's lonely because he's away from you know right. he's a unique species that's not in touch with his species right which is the other another thing with him in Luxana, which is nice. Mm-hmm. He's like, I'm all myself, and she's, well, I've never cared to be ordinary myself. Yeah, but like um, shapeshifters do ultimately like there is pleasure for them, and we as we find out later, it's just not expressed here. But I don't know if it's been clearly stated that there's not a physical pleasure for him. Right? There's like some sort of weird equivalent. You can't right. sp- splash him around or something. There's nothing you can do to him that's going to make him like dig it. You know? Right. Well, they haven't. They've got a weird dichotomy where they set him up as a shapeshifter, but they still treat him like a humanoid. Yeah. Where they imply that he can have romantic relationships, and then when he gets knocked out by getting a concussion in that vortex episode, it's like, well, why would that happen at all? Yeah, exactly. I think that's just bad writing. That's bad writing. Well, yeah, exactly. But they want to treat him. They want to treat him like a humanistic, even if he's not human, just like where we can recognize the humanity in him. So they treat him as if he has things that we accept that all humans have but at the same time they're trying to make him this alien thing so they don't really get around to integrating those two point of views that they're trying to sell for odo yeah also we have a really good little backstory with odo about where he you know like because i always said like i like i need to know more about like how he got to where he is yeah and they do that too after they found it they do that where they talk about that they you know they gave him to this bajoran professor to sort of research and analyze who he sort of looks at as like a father but it's not like a father because he didn't give him any int- like there's a whole story there that they yeah, say it's really good that yeah. was like the first time that we actually got any of this yeah and even to the point where odo used to try and make friends by like doing party tricks basically doing party tricks and he speaks of it in a way as like he was like a and I, I hate to use this term, but like a step and fetch and changeling. Right, right, right. Like just performing for people. And like that, that was really hollow and empty and sort of, you know, victimizing to him. And that that's that's good. This the show got better than it should have been. Yeah, yeah. Like in that elevator. Yeah, right. For like <laughs> for a Randy Luxana episode, yeah. this is actually 
pretty great. Yeah, yeah, they did stuff that we've been saying they want that we've wanted to see all yeah. all year. Because her whole character up until this point has been, let me go try to uh, seduce John Luke Picard, right. and my daughter is just rolling her eyes and putting her head in her hands the whole time. That's like her whole shtick. James, you got any background on this episode? Um, not really. I mean, like it was just a written episode. It seemed like it was pretty. I mean, it's one of Renee Abergenois' favorite episodes. They all liked uh michael pillar was the guy who wrote all of the robot or the computer shit okay yeah should have known and even to the point of taking really a lot of pride into uh the the shutdown sequence they tried is vaguely reminiscent to 2001 um, and i was like you don't want to compare that to that yeah, like, cinematic yeah. scene in wow. that cinematic masterpiece you don't, don't try to put yourself on a level with that buddy because you're not going to match up yeah because you were pulling chips out of a glow a glow board like no it's not the same thing is he also responsible for the ferengi godfather homage no 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 that, that was, was ira uh, bear right that was ira bear yeah oh that was all i think ira bear at this point is just owns ferengi yeah, so if yeah. anything really forward putting is being done with ferengis he wrote the episode. he literally wrote the book on the book ferengis. on ferengis yeah <laughs> he wrote the rules of acquisition the book yeah yeah, so that, that's what I, I mean. There's not much on it. Like, I think people sort of deal with it as like a throwaway episode, but it, no, it's good stuff. Yeah, it's, yeah. One of the things I, I have to, is this is something that I might know because I'm not a long time Trekkie and I don't like come from a family of Trekkies. Like, I could, I could imagine like there's a world, like if I was one of those guys on Trekkies where I was raised by my dad was a Trekkie and I watched this with my dad, mm-hmm. that there might be something about seeing Majel Barrett in a show it was kind of just like an old, hollywood joy unto itself yeah like when charo was on love boat or whatever <laughs> do i have so much affection for major barrett for being married to gene roddenberry and being in the pilot to start the first star trek the major character that the network kicked out kicked off the pilot because she was a girl and she's been sort of stuck with the series, so she's always been within the fiber of the series am i supposed to like her like seeing her I think like, so. There's a certain amount of fan service. I in think there. so. Yeah. Okay. Because I, I mean, I, I don't, and I, and I, and I understand that that's a disconnect to me because I'm not in the. I mean, I. She's a good. She's a good woman. I don't want to see right, her right. will. Yeah. I mean, it's not like I hate her and I love her in this episode. I think she's really great. Right. Well, like my whole thing, I wasn't. I mean, I grew up watching Next Generation, and this actually, as a kid, mm-hmm. actually first seeing her was like more like, oh my god, another Lexana episode, because mm-hmm. she's just one note in all this Next Generation, and it's like, look at me be the horny woman going after Picard, and he's not for it. basically she's Peppy Le Pew, it's it's, Mrs. Roper in space. <laughs> yeah, she's Peppy Le Pew in all the Next Generation stuff. So I was uh-huh. like, oh great, right. here we go. <laughs> now Odo is the cat with this paint down its back. But actually, it's a good release from all the Next Generation stuff when it's just about her and not her relationship to Picard or Troy. It's shenanigans. <laughs> it's actually the best, my favorite episode with that character. Oh, yeah, yeah. No, this is good stuff. And that's when I was like, my wife grew up. My wife's dad is a Trekkie. Yeah. And she grew up watching all this. And she didn't realize until I was forcing her to watch one of these documentaries on Star Trek that she was like, oh, like, Loxana Troy, it was married to Gene Roddenberry. And I was like, yeah, yeah. Like, that's why they kept trotting her out. Right. It's like a, I didn't know that as a kid either because you were a kid. Yeah, that's what know. I was wondering. Did you know? I mean, because no. I watched all of these I, as an I knew adult. it as a kid because I had an aunt that was a Trekkie that I watched this with. And she pointed all that stuff out. Oh, OK. And that she was in the, the original pilot and all that stuff. Yeah. Yes. Yes. Yeah. I mean, this is the kind of thing where I can go over to my aunt's house and she had the yeah, Star Trek encyclopedia <laughs> on her shelf that you could just pull stuff yeah. down. And Oh, wow. Yeah. She was deep back in the days when you had to buy stuff. Like Kurt Spock 1992 <laughs> sticker <laughs> on the minivan. <laughs> I remember that. Okay. She was in the wars of which one is the real captain, Picard or Kirk? Oh, uh, yeah. Probably. <laughs> Not my captain. Yes. That's Not something. my captain. That is that happened. That's a thing that happened. Um, all right. So we all agree we like the looks on a Troy stuff. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Then we have the other ones. Do we need to say much more? No. Bashir saves the ambassadors and then they all like him. Mm. Yeah. And he's not a he, I think this is closer to the Bashir we usually get. I think so, too. Yeah. Which is kind of like a hapless, tough shit keeps happening to him kind of guy. Right. And he just kind of weathers it. That seems to be like where they settle later instead of just being a total asshole. <laughs> like, right, right. I think they actually I think he actually used the phrase frontier space again. In he this did. Mess. He did. Yeah. I like that. It's like a, it's a covering his ass, too. Kind of snorted. Yeah. 
He was trying to protect Avery Brooks and, and Miles O'Brien because they're all bad mouthing the operation of the station. So yeah, he's like, "Well, this is frontier space. Don't talk shit about my boss so much." O'Brien is doing good jet work, and so is uh, Cisco. Yeah, this is frontier space. So every now and then, a bit of techno babble will shoot itself out at me, and that I'll notice. And one of them was someone said, "Hand me the bipolar torch." Yeah, I wrote that same thing down. <laughs> yeah, bipolar torch. And I was like, are we sure it's, can, can we trust it to take its meds? <laughs> yeah. Sometimes it's hot. Sometimes it's cold. Just leave it alone. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> but like, that's a term that wasn't used a lot in 1993 and now is for something totally different. No, so it was like, wasn't. Oh. I think the diagnosis was manic depressive back then. Yeah. So. Yeah. It's a hemi the manic depressive torch. No. <laughs> uh, the only other thing is I got, uh, this was the second episode in a row where there was a bit of fireball shooting down the hallway. Oh yeah. 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 Other than that, nothing. Then there's that. And then. O'Brien figures out how to that there's a probe that came through. Oh, we didn't even explain it. There's a probe that came through that looked like just a probe, but it had like an, an a program in it that turns out to be an alien intelligence, but it's just a program. It takes over the station. It's a puppy and it makes the Kardashian computer work better, except it doesn't like to be left alone and then it starts fucking shit up. And when they figure that out, O'Brien is like, Can I keep it? Can I keep it, Cisco? And then he built a doghouse. Right. Yeah. So somewhere on that, there's like a separate hard drive now that has a sentient being on it. Yeah, yeah. Just, he just, I'll take care of it. This episode, everything O'Brien does and says in this episode could have also been, it could have been put in an episode about O'Brien going crazy. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> like, yes. like, he is crazy and it's time. And like, you cut to like Absolutely. scenes where he's talking and then you cut to the scenes where Avery Brooks is holding Keiko while she's crying because <laughs> yeah. they're going to have to, they're going to have to put him away. Yeah. yeah, you think he's getting a little bit too attached to the computer? Like, <laughs> you hear what it's saying, right? It's t- it sounds different, right? Am I, I'm not the only one. Like you are the only one. Someone give him some meds. Yeah, we need to get the bipolar torch up. <laughs> right, right. Yeah, like that whole time I was like, why are they writing it this way? If it's not like they're not let, they're not trying to lead me down that road to think that maybe O'Brien went crazy. Yeah, yeah. But they're writing all of it in a way where he's just crazy. We need a dog. We need a dog house. Yeah, yeah. I need to, that's what I need. Yeah. <laughs> all right. Are we are we ready to talk about any? What would we change about this episode? Because we all kind of like it. Uh, I got just uh, just small mm-hmm. things this mm-hmm. week. You want me to go first? Go for it. I kind of felt like, and I I could be wrong about this, but <laughs> but Cisco's story about punching the rapist, uh, the ambassador, <laughs> yeah, the rapist was. I felt like it was a little bit like Chekhov's gun, like it should have gone off in the third uh, act, and that maybe maybe if Bashir actually punches somebody it would have been a little satisfying if that the end to that was him having to punch the, the blue guy out Ooh. <laughs> for one reason. That would have been oh, nice. yeah, or, or play around with it where the scene is leading up to it and then it cuts. And then at the end of the debris, they go and find Bashir and it turns out that he did something else and everybody's cool with him. Oh, uh, yeah. That's, you know, like, yeah. Do, a, do like a reverse or something. Either one mm-hmm. of those. Yeah. Sure, that would have been fine. But I felt like we were set up somehow mm-hmm. for that. And I, it felt a little like in my in my mind, I thought I was being set up for something. And so the fact that it didn't happen made me feel that that could be what was improved upon because didn't you guys feel that yeah that's it, true that would have yeah. been great yeah because they did you know cisco says well you don't go punching anybody right but i think he'd be okay if he were you know beating up a rapist <laughs> but yeah and, and so that was the one thing i really would have wanted to change about this particular episode it's just a small thing in comparison to what i usually say but also i am a little bit perturbed because we have this creature that lives inside the computer and it, it could almost be a new character yeah. and an interesting one, <laughs> but it never comes back. That was that's, It never factors again, I don't think. Nope. That was going to be my thing that I could change. Oh, I'm sorry, dude. Yeah, okay. You go ahead. We'll segue to yours. It's in one of the books. I'll just say this. It's uh, in okay, one of the that's books. Because that was going to be, if I could change anything, it would be less about this episode. And again, I've done this before, cop out, where I was like, I would have changed the later episodes where we called back this would or you know at least o'brien's like hey captain or, or not captain commander hey cisco commander cisco can we keep can i keep it can i keep it okay he's like i'll take care of it either have him taking care of it or have them come back to an episode as like see that's why we can't keep it because he goes back and there's like a dead puppy in the computer <laughs> oh, yeah. like, like oh, if Cisco's, so if Cisco's getting fixed. up in the middle of the night to change something out like to change its litter yeah, box yeah. or whatever yeah 
if if every now and then when they're doing domestic scenes with him and Keiko, if they just threw in like a just an illusion to where it's like what barking or keeping him up at night, that would have just been some great additional color to flesh mm-hmm. out that whole domestic scene with with, with him. Because honestly, a lot of the Keiko and him stuff seems kind of flat. Yes. If they could have thrown him, a, you know, every now and then the puppy wakes him up and Keiko is like, it's your turn or or whatever. That would have just been that would have been lovely. I would have liked it, whatever. But and then also, and since I'm doing a cop out and, and saying what I would want to be different later on, I would have called back the Odo Luxana relationship instead of the one that they settle on later. Yeah. yeah. Keep bringing her back. Uh, I actually, I think it ultimately maybe Major Barrett was in poor health. Yeah. Like I was good. That was what I was saying. When did she pass away? Yeah. It was even it maybe wasn't, before but, the show was over, but I think she was struggling with leukemia for the yeah. last years of her life. So, so I don't know. She's in four, three more episodes. of. She is in a few. Yeah. yeah. But I feel like I don't remember them, but do they ever get as intimate with her and Odo as this one? I don't, or they go so. back to her, being Pepe Le Pew and him having to be like, oh, I like you. Quark in an episode. Yeah. yeah. I think I would like to have seen a version of this episode where, because it's a good, whatever, it's a good seed of an episode. Like the Loxana Odo stuff really, really works. Mm -hmm. So like, just to say, like, take a good writer and write more of it. Yeah. Instead of having to fit in that A, B and C plots that are just like not as good. There's a lot of that filler A, B and C stuff. And there's also some filler in the Odo and Loxana stuff. Where she's basically just telling the entire events of another Star Trek episode. Oh, yeah, to yeah. Him. Yes. Like, I mean, like, there's some, like, it's got clip episode sort of level commitment. Yeah, I was like, oh, I remember that one where. Yeah. What I would like to have seen is, like, I mean, all of that stuff that they're doing, just expand it more. Go a little deeper, you know, and, like, give me a little more Odo, a little bit more Loxana, so that you can have Odo, who's a character who is uncomfortable around people, is forced to be around the most obnoxious person on Earth, and that they have this sort of really honest, revelatory sort of changing thing and then how they're stuck in the elevator they could be calling back to the crew about what's going on and it could seem like that's where you could add humor where it's like an increasing level of craziness whenever it cuts back mm-hmm. like the first time it's like no it's fine we're gonna have it fixed in like five ten minutes you know and like use some techno babble and then you go back and like everybody's like sweating you know there's like a lot of problems mm-hmm. but you're still stuck on the elevator once you get them to the elevator And then by the end, like, people are on fire and, like, crazy shit. And by the time they cut them out of the elevator, they're all, like, soot-stained and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. Where, like, everything got out of control, but you don't actually have to tell that story. Oh, yeah. It's just a backstory. And that's all in the background while they're in... Yeah. Just make a bigger bottle episode. Yeah, like, it's all about the elevator. Yeah, yeah. And what's making them stuck in the elevator is this big story with, like, lots of crazy shit. But you don't have to deal with it. Yeah. Because it's background. The B and C plot are still there. They're just not seen. Yeah. Or or they're played for comic effect by the extremity of when they call back and the cut scenes. Right. That's the kind of thing like if the writer's room was more nuanced, mm-hmm. they could write that all out and then realize it's better if they don't even show it. Yeah. That almost seems like something like Community would have done. Yeah. Yeah. Where you call back and like each each event is like, a, I mean, in, this is a more serious show, but play it for laughs. That would have been great, actually. Yeah. Yeah. Because I love that stuff going on in the background that you have to figure out. Mm-hmm feel like they don't trust their especially going back to you know this is 1993 94 yeah they don't i don't feel like audience was just, would have been trusted enough to figure out all the yeah. stuff behind i think that michael pillar is probably left to his own devices is a pretty good writer and i think that ira bear is too or at least an interesting writer mm-hmm. i think they know how to write stories and i think they know how to put them together i don't think anybody else on this first season writing staff is worth a name oh wow <laughs> and so I think that like But even Pillar and Bear write some stinkers in this first season. They do, they do. This show is is troubled from all kinds of misfocus. Yeah, like the way that I figured they do, you know, they get submissions unsolicited mm-hmm. and then they just pitch them to the writer's room. But the people that pitch the submissions just aren't involved. Like yeah. they're like, Oh, we're gonna buy your idea. But then they don't have any input to it. And That's then true. the writer's room gets a hold of it. And then they just do what they want with it. And a lot of times it doesn't work. And it seems like to me that like I think that that's one of the problems with it. And it seems to me that that's kind of proved by when Next Generation ends and all of the Next Generation writers 
come over to Deep Space Nine, mm-hmm. or a half of them do, and half of them go into production on, on Voyager. Like, specifically Ronald D. Moore and Robert Hewitt, and eventually uh, Brian Fuller gets hired. Like, the, the show goes through the roof on quality. Right, right. Well, they don't hire Brian Fuller. They buy two scripts from him. Yeah, that's true. And then they hire him on the Voyager, and he's like, oh, shit, I wanted to be on Deep Space Nine. <laughs> oh, wait, he wasn't writer's room on... No, like, I mean, I listened to the whole thing with him. He likes Deep Space Nine a lot more. Yeah, no, he was friends with Ronald D. Moore. Ronald D. Moore quit Voyager and made a huge thing about it. Right, because the way that they treated... About the way they treated Brian Fuller. That's what happened. He sold two scripts to Deep... I mean, we'll talk to this when we get to him. Yeah. But he, told, he sold two scripts to Deep Space Nine... So he was a guy they knew, and then they were going to hire him on into a writer's room, and he knew it was either going to be for Voyager or Deep Space Nine. And he was hoping they got him on Deep Space Nine, but they put him on Voyager instead. Uh-huh. And he was like, oh, man. <laughs> and then then he got to you know like watch from them in the windows and cry about it because Voyager was a nightmare, yeah, apparently, yeah, where all the people were assholes. Yeah, which I guess is all Brian Braga's fault. But yeah, I mean, I, I yeah. guess you have to read it that way. Yeah, yeah. All right. No, you got anything, Hugh? You guys want to know real quick about what this thing did on the scale? You guys want to make any guesses? I'm going to seven. I'm going to guess it's lower just because of uh, aversion to Loxana Troy. I'm going to say that fans liked this episode less than we did. Really? And Wade is go- Wade is going the other way. He's going to say it's a 7 out of 10. I'm going to say a 5.9. Whoa. Oh, okay. All right. Well, what we're looking at here, according to IMDb, there's 543 votes. It's a 6.7 out of 10. Oh, okay. People, so that was wrong. Okay. Oh, okay. People right. are pretty favorable yeah. toward it, so... That's where we are. But not as favorable as I am. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I would give it, I would put it at a seven. I would put it at a seven, too. I think this story is moving the ball in a way that, like, a lot of the other right. ones don't. Uh, so yeah. Next week, we have another Alien Possession episode. Yeah. Put your hats on. Yeah. Okay. No, wait. Uh, oh, okay. <laughs> I don't know. Yeah. And then we have a really good one. Then we have a that. really good like, one. And then we have the finale. Arguably the best yes. for some people. Yeah, like, the, yeah, the two episodes from now, we have what is, if you look up lists of the best of Deep Space Nine episodes, the next one there's two episodes from now shows up on a lot of like a number one on a lot of lists so yeah but so you can watch that but we have to wait two weeks before we talk about yes, it. yes we do <laughs> but just to keep you keep you coming yeah all, all right. right so i think we're done right are we finished here i think we're finished i think we're good all right three to beam out all right three boom all right Please follow us on Twitter. Hey, so what's up, everybody? Uh, so that was The Forsaken, uh, an episode early on. And yeah, it was actually it's a pr- pretty good episode, actually. I, I thought I, it's weird going back to these early ones where we're all complimentary about these kind of Alien of the Week episodes, I guess. Um, this Alien of the Week was, well... And one we know before, and and just the puppy, I guess. But uh, yeah, going over this one, it's interesting. We talk a lot about the techno babble early on in this with the the O'Brien has a puppy stuff, and it feels like almost it's almost an indication of some of where our future disputes end up. With like I, for instance, I say how much I liked the techno babble in this, and James and Hugh are like, "Woo, pu," because they they don't the the way that it supports their story i guess behind it like i like to use a trigger word how it kind of does the world building aspect of the techno babble in this with the computers and stuff and whatnot but uh yeah just it's interesting just little seeds of stuff i feel like oh wait this is just a minor thing in this episode but then later builds on that and when we diverge in our opinions on things it's almost indicative of that but anyways <laughs> oh and we're so uh it's so cute how like oh wait a minute what are the deal with trills here and uh this isn't like that episode in tng yeah i was like i was so innocent back then <laughs> when we're trying to remember the differences between tng trills and and ds9 and they're basically completely different and yeah you know and, and same with ambassador Curzon or Later, we know that he's an ambassador, I guess. But here, we're just, we have no idea. And they, like we say, the, the writers probably didn't either. And all this stuff, they didn't have any ideas about, like the a- alien-y Newman, I think I mentioned. Never mentioned again. 
I mean, not a surprise, but that Ferengi have a cousin species. Well, that's ain't that something that I guess there's just one of them, though. Uh, and then the bottle episode trope. I feel like there were. He says that they never do it on Star Trek. I feel like Picard got stuck in an elevator. And then there's where they have to crawl through turbo lifts and some stuff. But yeah, it's it is kind of a maybe un- underutilized. Uh, and like I said, this isn't a bottle episode. This is a uh, just an excuse for the romance, which, I mean, that's that's what I should be talking about right now. Not all this, hey, remember this? Oh, yeah, that thing I said in this episode, I should be talking about Luxana Troy, shouldn't I? I mean, that's the real meat of this episode. And it's like, honestly, you know, this is the best Waxana Troy episode, I think, in all of Star Trek. I think I said it here, but I kind of stand by it. Like, like actually, and I was going back through all of uh, her appearances in Star Trek, and a full third of them are in DS9. She was only in six. She's in nine episodes of Star Trek. Waxana is, of course, Major Barrett gets in a few more. But, you know, Deanna Troy's mom was in only six episodes of TNG she was in one every season except for season six but I still think this is this is I mean of the DS9 appearances this is for sure the best dare I say it the only good appearance of her in any DS9 episode because the other two are fascination and the muse and uh Less said about those, the better, I think, right? But in this one, it's good. I mean, in the show Bible that they wrote before DS9 really built on its own lore and legacy upon itself, the show Bible, like I think we mentioned, she was supposed to be like a much more major kind of love interest for Odo. Like, I clearly... Odo was going to be the cat with the paint down its back, as it were, for her Pepe Le Pew. But like James said, like her, perhaps her uh, health didn't really uh, lend itself to that. And also those episodes with her were bad. But this one, I mean, again, I have to say the best romance. And if we're going to talk about Odo and romance, I guess looking back, if this is a retrospective on going us going through DS9, I got to just got to compare it to uh, spoilers, the Kira relationship with Odo. And again, yep, this is so much better. I mean, everything about it. I, yeah, and it's already established that Luxana is into all kinky stuff and Kira is pretty vanilla. But actually, no, I mean, that's a, if you're going to have a prudish character make her go for the weirdest thing, that actually makes sense. But again, that Kira relationship is just kind of ham-fisted in there and it's, man what could have been right <laughs> oh and we we talk about Odo's lack of orgasms and uh, that's something else we come back to in graphic detail about uh, what gets left behind what you leave behind when you're a group person that fucks um, and yep I mean so there's little remnants there in later episodes um and then also we say i think oh and then finally in this episode is where they settle on the character of bashir which got a pretty good laugh from me when looking back on how much they do with bashir in this show where they'd never really quite get a grip on a a hard settle on what they're doing with the character until they again spoilers out the window now i mean of course it's only 30 years since the show aired he's a con and yeah at frontier space he brings up uh yeah (sighs) and which brings me to i think i've said before how much i love the what I would change about this episode. There's something to be said for this. Like, even in an episode, we are all pretty complimentary. We actually really like this episode. We think it's good. But the what would I change? I think we get spot on, but it, it kind of kind of lends itself, like, looking back, like, later on, when we once we leave the what I would change behind stuff, like, a lot of times I think we will latch on to things like they could have done to make things better. Like, there's a lot of things, especially in the last season, uh, that you could have done to make some of these plots better. And the last two seasons, 
but for me, like, just because it doesn't do the perfect thing doesn't make the entire thing is canceled, even in some of these episodes where, you know, like, we get later on where I'm saying this is a good episode and the guys are fighting me so hard on it, which, I mean, it's hard to account for. I don't know. I mean, I'm not the pure barometer of what's good, even though I try to be on that, hey, on that Picard show, uh, if you're if you're paying for CBS All Access, but that's a whole other podcast, uh, and I can p- hardly wait for yeah and that dead puppy <laughs> shame they didn't bring back that puppy in the machine that uh and a dead puppy yeah not to be confused with the sad puppy which is a thing that we don't like in sci-fi and Ooh. anyways yeah just because things aren't perfect don't mean they're canceled but i feel like i'm i'm ready to cancel myself on this <laughs> after just a, a brief look back on the the works of Majel Barrett. Oh, I'm on IMDb. And hey, what do you know? It's all Star Trek stuff and old 60s TV shows like FBI. And But so, uh, yeah, n- not much else to say. I mean, she's great and all, but uh, I don't have as much to say about her as I do about Wallace Shawn. <laughs> and, I w- and I will save you all the trouble of all of that. Anyways, thanks again for listening to uh, me ramble on about I mean, I hope you enjoyed re-listening to the show if not me go on uh check out all the other stuff you know listen to all the other stuff we're doing we, we have that uh the hashish and superiority book club if you want to hear us yell and get really vicious and also but star trek fans hey you saw it on the feed uh just last week <laughs> Camp Picardly Wait, where we're going through that Star Trek Picard show. Me and a couple of uh, my friends from uh, comedy up here. I'm not as old friends as James and Hugh, but some pretty good friends of mine who aren't Trekkies at all. I've been trying to really delve into, like, okay, what is good about Star Trek and what is worth leaving behind and what is it is all beholden to just being a fan and being into the lore and how much of it is actually uh just entertaining for someone that has no frame of reference and trek them because there's that's been an interesting experience going through the star trek picard on camp picardly wait uh you may have heard it on this feed there's a whole other feed now go check out that on the kickers of elves you know suite of podcasts or if you were subscribe to a discovery home companion hey guess what you're still subscribed to camp picardly wait even though the name change and everything but it's been an interesting thing because i've been you may have noticed us struggle with uh, our relationship to star trek as this podcast goes on i'm trying to thread the needle and enjoy what's good about it and enjoy the lore and everything else with picard but not be beholden to loving it just because they're feeding me some new star trek even though when I've tried to not get hung up on the things they're ruining about the Federation and just going along with it, I'm kind of liking the Picard show. Guys, I hope hope you uh, new Trek haters on there that like us for how much we hate Discovery aren't mad at me for liking Picard, but, uh, well, it's still got chance. It's still, still, still got plenty of time to uh, run afoul on the... We'll see how they do with this... Uh, samurai Romulan coming up but hey this thing the podcast about Star Trek Picard this one's about DS9 and I just got done talking about it and we'll be coming back with more uh, <laughs> looking back with you real soon on uh, the rules of acquisition and check us out James and Hugh and I are still putting stuff out on the Patreon and you know we always got things in motion and follow us on all the other places and we will keep you updated with all the things kickers of elves anyways thanks again for listening I uh, I appreciate all of you I don't love you in a carnal way like Luxana Troy does it's probably for the best but you know I'm I, you know I have fond emotions for all of you I won't get all lovey-dovey this time all right anyways I'm beaming out I, goodbye send us an email at rules of acquisition podcast at gmail.com you can turn this off now We believe in you.